holiness because we're trying to reach, we're trying to affect those around us, to reach our world, to affect the world around us. And one way in which we can effectively reach them, to impact them, to touch them, to have an influence on them is for us to grow. Now, how can we uh, impact others to grow if we're not growing ourselves? How can we teach and instruct others to abound in the things of God if we ourselves are not abounding in the things of God? It's much more than just uh, speaking words with our mouth, but it's living our life with actions. Now, we know we've all heard it all of our life that actions speak louder than than words. And that is so true because our world, now when I say our world, I'm not talking about uh, East Asia. I'm not talking about Africa. I'm not talking about India. I'm talking about those that you are around in Clinton, those that are you around in Raymond, those that are you around in Jackson, your world, those that you come in contact with every day your world they're watching you they're watching me they're watching us so we can grow we can experience growth in the church we can experience growth by us growing and their eyes seeing us and us affecting them now we know I've seen people and known people and experienced people and perhaps if I'm honest even I myself have gone through seasons of stagnation. You ever seen a stagnant mud puddle? You ever seen stagnant water where it's just dirty and nasty and there's just a film over the top of it? There's no movement. There's no water from above that's been added to it that has disturbed it. It's just stale, stagnant water. And if we're not careful in our walk with God, our relationship with God, it becomes can become stale it can become stagnant where there's nothing from above that's come on top of us right and disturbing it there's no movement but in our life we got to have movement we've got to allow ourselves to be touched and affected from on high so it's abounding more and more in the things of God it's drawing closer to God it's diving deeper into the things of God because we have not yet arrived and so we've got to push ourselves to get deeper into the things of God there's got to be a hunger that resides in the depth of every one of our soul that drives us and pushes us and propels us closer to the things of God because it's easy in our flesh and our humanity right to put up walls to put up boundaries uh, to to separate ourselves from the things of God, because the things of God requires uh, effort. It requires resources. It requires energy. It requires us to make deposits. And sometimes it's just easier not to make a deposit, not to exhort any energy, not to uh, have to spend any effort. But that's our flesh. But we have to push through our flesh and we have to abound more and more in the things of God drawing closer to God Paul pushes his audience to grow nearer the purity of holiness every one of us has to gravitate towards purity the purity of holiness if we back up to 1 Thessalonians the third chapter we find in verse number 10 that Paul uses the phrase lacking in your faith. It's just like him to push the buttons of his readers. Telling them that you know you've got some things right. But you still lack in your faith. There's still some things that you are lacking. And that's the reason why we need a voice in our life. Telling us that hey you're doing a good job. But you got to do better. It's not easy for us to, to hear those things, but that's why it's so important for us to hear the preached word of God and to be exposed to the taught word of God. It, it's, we find ourselves in a dangerous place when we deafen our ears to the voice that would say, 
you're doing a good job, but you got to do better. Every team knows that they've got to hear those words from the coach. You're a good hitter, but you got to improve. You're a good pitcher, but you got to improve. You're a fast runner, but you got to improve. And we need that because that's what helps push us and propel us and drive us in the direction, in the direction of the things of God. Every sports team knows, or every head coach knows, that if he does not continuously coach his team and push them and press them and push their buttons, then it's easy for them to draw and fall into a place of complacency and they take that step back. They're overtaken by their opponent, right? And so we got to have that voice in our life that says, hey, you're lacking in your faith. You could do a better job in this area. You've got to sure this up a little bit. That's not exactly the way that we do those things. Get back into the Word of God. Get into the prayer room. Miss a meal. It's important for us to hear those things. I didn't say it was fun for us to hear those things, but it's important for us to hear those things. So in 1 Thessalonians 3 and 10, Paul uses the phrase lacking in your faith. And so he's using this portion of his letter to address a few things that his audience was lacking in. He's pointing to them. Now we see in verses number 1 and 2 that he says, hey, you've got knowledge. You've got understanding. You've heard from us. You know what our teachings are. You know what the word of God is. But you're lacking in your faith. I want to push your buttons a little bit on some things. And one of those is holiness. Holiness. That is separation from the world and separated to God. We have to understand that we're not just separated from something. But we're separated unto something. We're separated for the, from the world and we're separated unto God for His purpose, for His witness, for His call. We're separated from the world. So He's calling them, pushing them, pressing them, bringing to the forefront of their mind that you have got to abound in holiness. But it's interesting that He says, hey, you got to abound in the holiness of what? Somebody read verse number 3 for me. Anybody? Fornication. He brings sexual purity or sexual deviance to the forefront. It's a sexual purity. It's a need for Purity of holiness, drawing nearer to that, to abound in the holiness of sexual purity. He's telling them that you've got to be sanctified. You've got to be separated and set apart from sin. And the reality is that every one of us is to abstain and back away from immorality. Now, sexual deviance and impurity, those are things of the flesh. So we've got to be separated from the things of the flesh. We have to be sanctified. That's separated and set apart from sin. It's very important for us to be sanctified. To be set apart. If we are to be a saint... If we are to be a chosen one, if we are called by God, if we call ourselves Christians, Christ-like, if we're walking with God, a believer in a relationship with God, then we are to be sanctified. We are to be separated. We are to be set apart from sin. Verse number 4 says that every one of you would know how to possess his Vessel in sanctification and honor. We have to understand that we have to control our body. Our flesh. In what? In holiness. That's separated from the things that are profane. That is separated from the things that would mar us, dirty us, scar us. It's control. It's so hard for us to exercise self-control. 
in every facet of our life. No doubt everyone under the sound of my voice can testify to the fact that it is so difficult for us to tell ourselves no. Now it's easy for us to tell someone else no because it doesn't cost us anything. Telling someone else no doesn't affect us. Telling someone else no doesn't hurt our feelings. Telling someone else no does not put restraints on us. But when we tell ourselves no, we're putting handcuffs on ourselves. I'm handcuffing myself and I'm not allowing myself to pick up that chocolate brownie. I want it, but I'm telling myself no today because it's Sunday and I'm starting a diet tomorrow. <laughs> Come on now. It's hard for us to tell ourselves no, but we have to walk in self-control that we have to keep our flesh in control our flesh in subjection that is what control is in holiness in holiness separated from things that are profane we walk in holiness we live in holiness we dwell in holiness and that's simply separation living holy for God holy for God when, if I have 100 $1 bills and I say I'm putting all completely whole, the whole $100 into the offering pan, how much is going into the offering pan? A hundred, all of it. If we say we're living wholly for God, then what? Every ounce every part of our being is all in on God Jesus said you can't serve two masters you can't have one foot here and one foot there you can't straddle the fence you can't be pulled in two different directions but we have to live holy for God that's what holiness is separated from the things of the world so verse number four we read but we are his vessel to be used for his service and we are to be kept in sanctification and honor he's telling his audience that you are his vessel and I can tell you that God no matter how the world wants to present it no matter how uh, the, the world wants to frame it God still requires holiness because without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Holiness is a requirement of God. And that is sanctification. That is purity. That is righteousness. That is separation. And God expects his vessels to be holy. His vessels to be clean. His vessels to be pure. Who in here wants to go to the cabinet and grab a glass and look at it and it's full of crusty dried food. And drink out of that glass. No, you're going to look at it and say, you know what? Dishwasher missed this one. And where's it going? It's going back in the sink or it's going back in the dishwasher. At least I'm not going to use a dirty glass. You might, but I'm not going to. And I'm telling you that if God is going to use anybody, he's going to use someone that walks in holiness, that walks in righteousness, that abstains from sin, that abstains from the very appearance of evil, that's separated from the world and separated to him it's growing in God it's living in God walking with God and understanding that we are his vessel to be used for his service anyone want to read verse number five yes sir I set you up, brother. <laughs> we are not to walk in the lust or longing for what is forbidden. That's what that word means. It's, it's a longing for what is forbidden. The contrast is those which know not God. Because he says, even as the Gentiles which know not God. 
They were giving themselves over to the things that were forbidden. They were giving themselves over to those things which were unrighteous. But he's telling them, don't be like them. Don't have a longing for the things of the world. Don't have a longing for the things which are forbidden. Don't have a longing for those things which we know that we are to be separated from. I'm telling you that if we're not careful and we have a longing for that which is forbidden. And we let that desire continue to percolate within us. Then it, before long we can be given over to those things which are forbidden. Verse number 7, for God hath not called us, or excuse me, number 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. I want to read verse number 6 out of the Amplified, because I love the way that it makes a connection here. And it says, and that in this matter of sexual misconduct, remember that's what he started out here with. No man shall transgress and defraud his brother because the Lord is the avenger in all these things just as we have told you before and solemnly warned you. We got to understand that the Lord sees and he knows everything. That he sees and knows everything. And that he is the avenger of all such things. I don't know about you, but I want to walk uprightly. I want to be pleasing to God. I want to know and understand that his eyes are cast upon my life every day. That every thought, every action, every word, he sees, he knows, and he understands. Do I always get it right? No. More times than not, I get it wrong. I'm thankful for his mercy and his grace in those situations. But I've made up in my mind, I want to have a heart that's always pointed towards God that's always pointed towards repentance that understands that he is God and I am not and I need him every single day verse number seven for God has not called us to uncleanness but unto uh, but to holiness there's a theme here it's holiness a call to holiness God has not called us to unrighteousness to impurity but to holiness separation unto God Verse number 8, he therefore that despises, despises not man but God, who also, or, or who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. We can't despise the things of God. We can't despise the call for holiness. We can't despise the call to live in righteousness and purity. It's like I said, if we let those desires percolate within us have you ever seen anyone that it seems like that they try to live for God in anger and bitterness because of all the things that they feel like that they can't do that's the wrong perception that's the wrong viewpoint that's the wrong way to understand living for God we have freedom in God freedom over sin we have peace in God because we live within the confines of his word. And there's no safer place for us to live and dwell than in the confines of God's word. It's the safest place that any of us can live. So we don't want to reject or disregard the things of God. Because we're not rejecting man. We're rejecting God. We're rejecting his Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Because he has given every one of us his spirit to live within us. To empower us and enable us and propel us. And I'm thankful. Brother BJ, will you read verses 9 through 12 for us? I find it interesting here that Paul links holiness to our relations with others. When we think of holiness, I can tell you that there's no one under the sound of my voice whose mind goes straight to our relations with others. 
none of us. We don't, it, for whatever reason, our teaching or upbringing or whatever, our mind doesn't often go to that. But it's interesting that Paul links holiness to relations with others. You know that it's becoming upon us to have brotherly love. That's a call from God. That's a mandate from God for us to have love for one another. To have to love our neighbor. To, to do good to them. To speak to all men peaceably. Holiness is brotherly love. Holiness is our temperament. Holiness is the way in which we work. And the way in which we conduct our business. I can tell you right now. No one's going to think you're a holy person if you're always on the, the, the rampage at work. If you're always fighting and opposing your next door neighbor. If the, the, the brother across the, the sanctuary, you're always being contentious towards them. Paul saying, hey, holiness is every bit as important with your relations with others as it is anything else. It's the way in which we work, the way in which we conduct ourselves. Because why? Brother BJ's been teaching to us about growing, about growing. And part of that is witnessing, affecting those around us. I don't know about you, but I want to grow within myself and I want to see growth around me. Growth in our church. Growth in our church. And we have to walk in integrity. We've got to have moral courage to do what is right. And then finally... He moves on to verse number 13 where he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now this word sleep or asleep, it's kind of a euphemism. Help me out, Brother BJ. Euphemism. <laughs> My Lord, I should have practiced that one more time. But you get what I'm saying. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's just an example, uh, you know, a way of phrasing those which are dead. But I, I, think, I think that it's interesting to know that uh, death is not final. Death is not final. Now, we think death is the end, that death is the finale, the finale, that there is no more. But when you went to sleep last night, you knew that you were going to awaken this morning, that there was going to come a, another day. There was going to be more time after sleep. So it's interesting that this is phrased or coined or presented as those which are asleep. Meaning that there's going to come a time that they're going to get up, right? Your soul, your, your inner being is going to live for all eternity. So don't sorrow as others which have no hope. Because we have hope. We have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we have to have belief in the resurrection even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So every one of us has a hope that when we die, we're dying in Christ Jesus. That he will bring us with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So there's some that's going to still be alive, walking, breathing when he comes back. But there are others that are already asleep. There are those that have already gone on that are dead in Christ Jesus. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And what does it say? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. But then he says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a wonderful hope and promise we have. I want to point something out right here. 
in verse number 17. What does Paul say? Then what? We. It's interesting that Paul is writing this. And he says, then we which are alive and remain. He's talking about the Lord coming back, is he not? It's interesting that Paul thought that he would see the coming of the Lord while he was alive. That's the way in which they thought and believed and lived their life. That, hey, I'm going to see the coming of the Lord in my life. If we're not careful, we can live our life in such a manner that we uh, subconsciously develop this belief system that the Lord's not coming back. Or we got plenty of time. Or, you know, uh, that'll be for someone in the future. But I want to be like Paul and I want to live my life in such a way to where I say, Hey, we, we, that's me, which are alive and remain shall be caught up together because I just believe that the Lord is coming back for me, for me. And I just believe that together we're going to gather together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and Forever we shall be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And that's what we're doing this morning. We're comforting one another with the word of God. With these words. And as I close, just to recap. Paul has this call for holiness. And we're just like them. We've heard the word of God. We've been exposed to the word of God. We know what has been taught and what has been preached. But we have to abound more and more in the things of God. A continuation of growth, of moving forward, of marching forward. And we have this knowledge that if we continue in the things of God, if we continue in the word of God, if we continue growing in God, then we have a blessed promise that we will remain with him forever and ever and ever. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Let's pray. Mighty God, we're so thankful for the hope and the promise that we have in you. I pray, Lord, that you would help every one of us to continue to walk, to continue to abound more and more in you. Help us to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Help us to pursue after you, Lord, and the things of your word. And I'm so thankful for the promise of what happens to those which are asleep in you and those which remain in you, that you will call us and we will live with you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be dismissed.